I'm not quite sure whether I belong here or not. Uh, I started out as an electrical engineer. I had a premature sort of midlife uh, male menopause and uh, I decided that biology is probably a little more interesting and so I got into biology through the back door and most of my work really nowadays has to do with looking at low level vision and perception in, in, in small flying insects, honeybees, and applying some of the ideas we learned from, from that uh, into designing vision systems to guide autonomous aircraft. So it's really um, engineering inspired by biology. But also along the side, we have been dabbling in our lab with looking at uh, the perceptual capacities of uh, honeybees in particular, and looking to see how far you can push the perceptual capacity, capacity or the cognitive capacities uh, of a creature with a small brain, uh, typically under a million neurons. Uh, how much can you, how much can you get a bee to do? I mean, bees will obviously learn things, but they learn things in a very uh, stereotyped, in a rote fashion, or can their learning be flexible? Can you put a bee into a new context and make it do things that it normally wouldn't do if it was just a, just a robot, for example, a simple robot? Those are the kinds of questions we have been asking in the past. And what you'll see mostly now is, is a review of some of the work that we've done in our lab over the past 20 years or so. Unfortunately, we're not working in this area anymore. I don't have any brand new hot results to present to you, but let's see how we go. And if, if and I'm sorry you couldn't make it to the Panpsychism introduction yesterday because I just came back from international travel. So, um, you know, I, I don't know whether what I'm going to be saying today will actually fit into that theme. So if it doesn't, please uh, send me home. <laughs> okay. Well, let's see how we go. Okay, that, that, that's today's uh, topic of today's talk. Am I, am I getting in the way of uh, some? I'm sure I'm getting in the way of somebody here. Yeah, I'm not quite sure how I can do this without. Uh, should I put this on some other thing? Mm -hmm. I'm all right. I'll just move around a bit so we. Should I sit? Should I sit? Is that okay? Yes. Um, you rather have me stand? You're more visible if you stand. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so that's, that's the title of uh, the talk, and of course the quest, big question mark, or the small question mark at the bottom, uh, conveys everything, I think. Um, now, as many of you probably know, uh, <coughs> bees uh, are known to be, uh, uh, well, clever. Uh, they will learn a, a whole myriad of things. They will. Uh, uh, learn colors. A bee can be trained to uh, learn a color in uh, half an hour. Five rewarded visits to the right color and the bee has learned the color and it will remember it for a very long time. Uh, they will learn patterns, um, uh, shapes. Uh, they also seem to uh, generalize the learning of patterns and shapes to some extent. For example here, you can train bees in a, in a Y maze, the way you train uh, rats, for example, to distinguish between, in this case, vertical gradings, vertical strike patterns on one side, and horizontal strike patterns on the other side. They will learn to distinguish the two if you reward one of them, for example, a vertical one. Uh, within a day, uh, they'll be choosing the correct pattern about 90% of the time. Similarly, uh, horizontal versus vertical, or you know, oblique this way versus oblique that way, they can learn that. But not only that, uh, you can take these patterns that you train them on and then present them with, with novel patterns that have the same orientations but which don't necessarily look the same. And they will, so having been trained to distinguish plus 45 from 95, <laughs> you give them these two single stripe patterns, they will pick the pattern with the correct orientation uh, very lively, uh, significantly uh, with a higher preference. Similarly, this pattern is preferred over that, <coughs> this thing is preferred over that. That thing is preferred over that. And these, these are going to be sine, sine wave gradings. This is preferred over that. Uh, and, and this is preferred over that. So it, it looks like they can, in abstract, the general property of orientation in this case, uh, in these patterns, uh, and apply them to this distinguish between novel patterns that have the same properties, namely orientation. So the learning is not just uh, photographic or eidetic. It really, they really are extracting general properties of these patterns and using that to distinguish between novel patterns that they haven't seen before. So here's another example, again training on this. That's the positive stimulus, that's the negative one. Give them that, and then you test them with this. They prefer this. You test them with these, these Kanitsa rectangles with the illusory contours. They prefer this. And what is needed is that when you rotate these Kanitsa circles and break the illusion, they behave as though they cannot see the orientation of these illusory contours anymore which suggests that really, that really are perceiving the illusory contours, which also tells us perhaps that you know, the whole phenomenon of illusory contours is not the cognitive explanation, 
right? The, the, the cognitive explanation is that uh, your brain says, ah, this cannot be you know, four angles that are all arranged in such a way, in exactly such a way that it looks this way. It really must be four circles with a white envelope placed on it. <coughs> that's the higher level cognitive explanation. But maybe that's not what's happening in bees. We don't know anything about envelopes, right? But what's happening probably is the fact that the brain is visual cortex V1, and probably the cortical analogs of neurons in, in the bee brain uh, have neurons that respond to, to edges which are parallel and aligned. And uh, sense that as an edge, as an, as an edge that's been included. So that's, that's what we think is going on. So anyway, there's an interesting parallel between uh, the way bees perceive some of these illusions uh, and the way uh, we do. Uh, here's another example. Uh, some of you have already seen this image. Um, um, but for those of you who haven't, uh, what, what do you see here? Uh, you see the young lady here. Uh, you see the, the mountains in the distance and the birds flying around. And you might see, if you look carefully, you might see uh, hands and, and fingers there. And you might see oh, yeah. a flute, and then eventually uh, the face. Mm. Right. So now, uh, once you uh, once you've seen this image and uh, you know uh, detected the camouflage objects, you will never look at this image in the same way again. <laughs> Every time you look at this image again, these hidden objects will leap out at you. Right. So we have this amazing facility of cognitive capacity called top-down processing, which allows us to reach down into the noise and pull out the signal even if it's buried in the noise once you know what you're looking for. All right, so we wondered whether lowly creatures like bees also have something akin to top-down processing. So here's the experiment. We train bees again in the Y base to distinguish between two different stimuli. They're placed on the, on the back plane, vertically oriented like this, uh, on the back plane of a Y maze. And, and they're both camouflaged. So, uh, one of them consists of a, a textured ring presented against a texture, similarly textured background. These are random textures. You can't see it, of course, because it's camouflaged. And this side, you have a textured disk presented against a similarly textured background. Now, there's some distance between the actual figure, the object, and the background. So the only way the bee can, can detect the object is through motion parallax. So for example, as she approaches the object, I say she by the way because the bees we work with are all females, they work at bees. Um, as she approaches the pattern, if she swings from side to side, because the target is actually closer to the bee than the background, there will be motion parallax between the target and the background. That relative motion allows the object to pop out perceptually mm. and be detected. Right? So that, that's the idea. So otherwise, they're perfectly camouflaged and you can't see them. So if you train bees to, if you try to train bees to distinguish between the, the texture of camouflage ring, and the textured camouflage disk, uh, they can't do it. You can train them for five days, which is a very long time in the lifetime of a bee. They still will not learn to do it. They're just too pleased to do it. However, if you start with uncamouflaged versions of these two objects, this uh, black ring on the white background and a, a black disk on the white background, uh, they can learn that task quite well and easily. See, this, is, this one is one that is water. They pick that up quite well. <coughs> And then you present them with camouflage versions of the same objects, they can do it immediately without mm. any training. Mm. So somehow, something about this prior knowledge that's been put into their brains by training them on these uncamouflaged patterns has taught them the trick to, to, to perceive these things. Not only that, these trained bees can now be exposed to normal camouflage patterns. So this, for example, is, is, a, is a vertical bar textured bar presented against a textured background. That's a horizontal bar. I don't know if I tell you. I can't tell which one is which, can I? <laughs> one of them is a vertical bar. The other was a horizontal bar. Uh, and they can do this task without having to be pre-trained again on these shapes. So novel shapes which are camouflage can also be distinguished because now they've learned the trick. And the trick is to actually break the camouflage by moving sideways and having the object pop apart, right? So these bees have now been trained to look at the world in normal ways, in ways that they normally wouldn't look. All right, which is not bad. Eh? Not bad for a bee, yeah. <laughs> I think, anyway. Question? Just a quick back ahead question. Oh, so they represent numbers of bees or numbers of tries for a single bee? Uh, this is a, a, a pooled numbers of bees and number of tries. It's, 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 it's a dozen bees and 700 tries. <coughs> yeah. 
Uh, let's move on to, how are we doing for time, by the way? I no, that's know. fine. Actually, yeah. Yeah, Still I'll within say, 20 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, maze learning. Um, uh, maze learning has been sort of beaten to death by people who work with rats and so on. That's it's very well known. But at the time when we started to look at maze learning, uh, almost nothing had been done with, with insects to try and see whether insects can learn to navigate mazes. Um, so we started out by looking to see whether bees could uh, learn to go through a labyrinth like this, composed of a number of uh, um, cubicle boxes. Um, and and uh, so there's a route through this thing. The correct route takes them to a wood reward. So the idea is, OK, we start off by making the task fairly simple to them. Um, uh, we, we train them by showing them wherever there is a, you know, more than one exit in a chamber, the correct exit is labeled by a green tag placed beneath the exit hole. So the bee learns to recognize the exit hole. So uh, what you do is you start off by training bees to come to a sugar water feeder. And the feeder itself has this label on it. It's a, it's a green label. It's a green tag. Uh, and then you take this feeder in step by step, slowly, through the maze. Uh, and the bees follow. And as they follow, of course, they, as they go through the route, they notice that these green tags um, you know, identify the correct exit. Uh, and it turns out you don't have to take the bee through the entire route. You can take them through the first two or three boxes. Uh, by then they've got the hang of it, and you can take the feeder away <coughs> and place it at the destination at the far end, and the bees will actually fly right through it. Um, this actually shows you, don't worry about the details here, this shows you that they're actually performing very well and making very few mistakes in the process. Now let's see if this video actually works. Sorry about that. <coughs> Here's a train B actually going through, uh, going through this maze. Which is following the green tag. That's the reward box. So she's mm. done it. Mm. Uh, and once you train these bees, you can take them to a novel route uh, just by say, rearranging the tags. So you can make them go through whatever. You can even make them go around around circle if you want to, but we never do that. That's cruel. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you can do that. So it's, it's, it's quite interesting that they actually learn this task quite well. Um, now, the next task is a little more challenging. Uh, this is to, uh, again, let, show them the route through the ma maze, but this is in a much more symbolic way where you label the, 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 the route through the maze uh, by using a cutter that's placed in the back wall of each box. So wherever there's a, there's a choice between going to the, turning to the right and turning to the left, you have a color which signals that the blue here means turn to the right, uh, and the orange uh, here means turn to the left. This is, these are symbolic signposts that they have to learn in order to navigate the maze. And what surprised us was these can do this just as well as the task of just dumbly simply following a green tag. <laughs> so that was quite interesting. So symbolic route following also seems to be possible. Um, and then finally, of course, this is the ultimate, the real maze, where uh, there are no, no signposts or, or, or guides. And the bee really has to learn the route uh, by being taken step by step through the entire maze by moving a feeder through it to the end. And, and of course, the performance here is not anywhere near as good as in the other two cases, uh, but it's certainly significantly better than chance, so they certainly are learning the route. And it turns out this is the only case where they actually learn the route. In all the other cases, when you train the bees using these tags and you take away the tags, they're completely lost. They have no idea. They haven't learned the route at all. So it's only in this case where they're forced to learn the route <laughs> that they actually learn the route. So in that respect, I think bees are very human. Because when you're driving somewhere and mm -hmm. the passenger is navigating, you never learn the route, do you? <laughs> you learn only when you're forced to learn it. You're forced to learn it yourself. Mm. That's kind of interesting to us. Okay, here's another task which is used by, uh, it's been used by a number of, uh, I guess, psychophysicists. psychophysicists uh, uh, it's called the delayed master sample task. And uh, uh, many of you are probably familiar with it. So the idea is you're given uh, one stimulus, which could be a color, for example, uh, green. And then uh, a short while later, they're given a choice of two stimuli, one of which is green, the other one might be blue or something. 
and you're supposed to pick the color that matches what you've shown uh, in, the, in, the, in the trying the trial, right? So it's the case that uh, whatever is flashed up in front of you, you store that in, in working memory, and then a while later when you're given that stimulus plus something else, you've got to identify the correct stimulus, the one that was presented to you before. So uh, that's been looked at, of course, in um, humans and in monkeys and in, in pigeons, I think. But when we did the study, uh, no one had looked at insects to uh, see whether they could do this kind of thing. So that's what we decided we'd try and do. So here's a simple thing. What you do is you, you take the bee, you have it come into a, these are three different cylinders, place like that, and the bee, that, that the, uh, that's the, um, uh, what do you call it, the um, standard sort of uh, flash stimulus, the indicator, we call it, we call it the indicator stimulus. Uh, uh, they see that, and then once they get into the chamber, of course, they cannot see the indicator stimulus anymore, so they have to store it in memory. And then here they have these two comparison stimuli, and they've got a the yellow here, they've got to choose the yellow and one over here. They do that to get a reward. If it's blue here, they've got to choose the blue one there, and they get a reward. So that's how the training goes. So that's the sample stimulus, and those are the comparative stimuli. So the idea is you've got um, two comparison stimuli and one sample. So if the sample is yellow, the bee's got to pick the yellow. If the sample is blue, the bee's got to pick, pick the blue. And it turns out that the bees can do this task very well. They can be trained to do this and pick the correct stimulus uh, to within about 80 or 85 percent uh, of the trials. So they do quite a nice job of uh, learning delayed mass to sample. They can also be trained to do delayed non-mass to sample, which is to pick the opposite stimulus, and that works uh, just as well. Um, here's uh, one with uh, gratings now, oriented in orthogonally. So you put <coughs> that, you've got to pick that, there's that, you've got to pick that. And again, their performance is just as good as well with colors. Um, now, you can also use this paradigm rather conveniently to measure uh, how long they can hold the memory of the, of the, of the sample uh, in working memory, right? So very easy. All you do is you, you move this, <laughs> this sample still as further and further away so they've got longer and longer before they actually go and make a decision. And if you do that, um, it turns out that the, uh, the critical duration is about five seconds. So beyond five seconds, they seem to figure out. So they can hold this for about five seconds. Uh, this is about the length of time you might be able to hold a telephone number in your head between the time you look it up in a phone book and actually make the phone call. <laughs> I mean, that's just a coincidence by me, but anyway, five seconds seems to be the, the duration. That's really? Yeah. Have, has anybody tried to distract the uh, honeybee very, on the way? Very interesting. Um, uh, my, my colleague, uh, we were working this with uh, Dr. Zach Sahu. He found that initially we had um, we had textures pattern, texture patterns lining the, the the walls of the tunnel. So as they flew in, uh, they they saw a texture which seemed to be distracting them because when we took off the texture, mm. they performed much better. Uh, and the other thing we noticed, and this could again be a coincidence, I have no idea, but uh, there was a chainsaw operating during some of these experiments. When the chainsaw turned went on, this performance deteriorated. Huh. So. Uh, it could have been just a coincidence, but I don't know. I, did, I have a feeling distractors do play a role. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, another, another question? So, did, did we systematically know that bees can do and or and exclusive or, or something like that? Yeah, that I, I think so. I, I, don't know, uh, I don't know whether all of those have been done, but uh, Martin Gierfer, uh, at Marseille has been doing a lot of these things, and I, I, I think that's right, yeah. I think that's right. Um, here's one instance where the um, this delayed match to sample task can actually tra be transferred across sensory modalities. So I won't go into the details of this slide, but the idea is the bees in this case are being initially trained to match uh, odors, scents. <coughs> so for example, the idea is if it's, there's two scents, for example, uh, lemon and, uh, and rose, and if the bee uh, gets a, a sniff of a of the lemon here, she's got to pick a lemon scent over there. If it's rose, she's got to pick a rose scent. Mm. So the bees learn that task again quite well. And then, without any warning, they're confronted with a, with a color matching task. So the scents are taken away. You've got, you put colors in. They're not trained on the colors, but they can match the colors. 
So they've learned the concept of matching in a fairly general sense, and they're applying it, they're transferring across sensory morality, so it's away from, from olfaction uh, to vision, which, which would seem like it was actually quite, quite, quite interesting. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, here's, um, um, if I look at this, um, I always think it's my lemon. I don't know if it works for you. <laughs> it works for me. Um, associated recall is a very powerful thing, right? I mean, you, you look at an image or you hear a piece of music, <clears throat> and you can hear everything that was associated with it. If you listen to a piece of music that happened, that you listened to when you were a school kid, and that might conjure up you know, very old memories, or you might get a whiff of uh, a perfume or cologne, and that might remind you of some girlfriend that often you knew a long time ago, but don't necessarily want to talk about it anymore. <laughs> so associated recall is a very powerful thing. Uh, and we wondered whether whether this complex associated recall is, is also a, a feature of uh, honeybee, honey, honeybees, and whether they experience anything like that. So um, so here's the, uh, here's the uh, test. The idea is we're trying to see whether um, uh, the whiff of a scent can conjure up memories uh, of, a, of a food feeding site that the bee has previously visited. So here's the experiment. We train bees to go from this hive to, to visit um, a, a feeder placed in this location. Uh, and the feeder has the scent of, of rows. Uh, so bees, individually marked bees, uh, are trained to visit this feeder. And then we take away that feeder and place another feeder at a different location. And this time, the feeder has the scent of uh, lemon. So the same bees are now being trained um, to uh, go and visit this uh, lemon-scented feeder. And then we alternate back and forth. Every time the feeder is over here, it has the scent of rose. Every time the feeder is over there, it has the scent of lemon. Uh, so the question is, do they learn to associate each one of these locations uh, with uh, its particular scent? So the way we test that is, um, for one thing, we leave the bees alone for a couple of days. I think the training finished uh, on a Friday. So the weekend, they're free to go wherever they want. There's no food over here, so they can forage wherever they want. So they could distract us somebody, <laughs> the principal. Um, anyway, can we come back on Monday morning. Uh, and we place two uh, dummy feeders. These are just empty feeders that have no sugar water, no scent. There's a rose feeder here, a lemon feeder here, dummy, dummy feeders. <coughs> they call rose feeders because that, 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 that location was the location where the rose feeder used to be, and this is where the lemon feeder used to be. So they're just empty feeders with no scent. And you simply inject <coughs> a, a scent into the hive. So it's actually quite early in the morning. There's no bee activity at all. Uh, it's quiet, but the moment you inject a rose scent, uh, the marked bees, your trained bees, only the ones that you mark actually appear from the hive, and, and most of them, or the majority of them, um, look for the fruit where the former rose scented feeder used to be. Mm -hmm. um, and again, if you inject a lemon scent, uh, the same bees appear again, and this time, most of them look where the former lemon feeder used to be. So what's nice about this experiment is that there's no scent of the target, right? So they cannot simply be homing in on the scent that they've smelled in the hive. <laughs> the scent has to conjure up, uh, create a recall uh, of the target, and they fly towards that. And it turns out you can make you can make the scent trigger a number of different things. You can make it uh, trigger a color, for example. So it, location may not be important, but you could say, for example, make lemon be associated with yellow, a yellow-colored feeder and uh, rose bees sort of a blue colored feeder, that works too. So you can make scent trigger or conjure up various memories, uh, including, for example, we think, although we haven't tested this, memories of the, the landmark that you, that you can expect to encounter along the route, memories of the distance you have to travel to get there, all of those things I think will probably be held there, although we haven't uh, looked at these uh, uh, very systematically. Um, yeah, now here's some, some lovely work that was done um, uh, by a, a chap called James Neer um, a few years ago. Um, and, um, boy, I hope this thing works. Why am I having so much trouble? This looks okay. Um, all of you know the, uh, you probably know about honeybee plants, where a bee that's found a good source of food comes back home and signals to the other bees where the good food location is. This, by the way, she's come back with uh, 
with the pollen in her hind legs. So she's discovered a nice source of pollen and she's signaling mm. where the food source is. So um, the direction of the see the waggle where she moves her bamboo from side to side, that's the waggle. And the waggle face has all the information about how far away the food source is and what direction to fly. So she's wag her waggle direction is directly downwards. Um, so the sun, by the way, is being referred to the vertically upward direction symbolizes the direction of the sun. Uh, and, and so why, because she's moving, well, why is he waggling when he downwards? It means the, the bees that are observing his dance so I have to fly in a direction that's 180 degrees away from the direction of the sun. So they have to put the sun behind them and fly for a distance that's proportional to the duration of a wagon. So if I go back to the beginning, uh, is that continuing or is that coming back? So the duration of the spiral phase is proportional to the distance to the food source. So there's distance and direction being indicated in a rather symbolic way um, to help the other bees pinpoint um, the food source. Also, quite <coughs> often, uh, the other bees will, will beg this bee for nectar samples, uh, which she will she'll top her dance and begin to take these nectar samples. So the bees have an idea of um, not just where to go, but what the quality of the food source is, is mm -hmm. over there, and they can decide whether it's worthwhile to go all the way there or not. So it is interesting sort of trade-offs you have to accept. Sorry? Do the other bees watching this visually? Is that how they um, Mostly not visually. It, these dances usually happen in the dark because the honeycomb is necessarily dark. So it's vibrations that they're picking up, airborne vibrations and substrate vibrations on, on the actual honeycomb. So how many, how far that spread? Speed not very far, not very far. So it, 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 it signals only to the local cohort of bees that are around this bee. And they're, they're, I don't know if it's very obvious here, but they quite often follow the bee with their antennae sort of sticking out, so they're sensing the air vibrations caused by the waggle of her abdomen. Yeah. Um, so the, the question is then, do you, do, you, do, you, do you fly a long way to get to a good food source, or do you fly a shorter distance to get to, to, get to a crummy food source? I mean, there's a trade-off there, right? So they're doing these trade-offs. And it looks like they're optimizing or maximizing the ratio of uh, energy brought in in terms of calories. Uh, to energy expended to, to get to get the food. <coughs> Sorry, just to follow up, are the neighboring bees able to land the dance and then go and do it somewhere else, or do they actually physically have to go and fly to the food source, come back? They have to go to the food source. Okay. They have to. Uh, they have to voice their own opinion. Right. They cannot just copy the dance. In fact, there's lovely work uh, done by uh, Tom Seeley where. You know, with, uh, there's a consensus that gets raised. So especially when bees are searching for a new home or they're swarming and they're looking for a new home, um, just like looking for food sources, um, different scout bees will go and search out different potential new homes. Uh, they have ways of uh, guessing the, or assessing, I should say, the volume of the nest cavity, the potential new nest cavity, and the surface area. And they'll come back and do a dance that signals not only where the location is, but how enthusiastic the bee is about that. That, that, that is conveyed by the number of loops the dance makes. I mean, the number of loops that the, the bee makes in that dance. And so that's a measure of, it's called the dance intensity. Um, and so the other bees actually watch this and go and check out these things. And they come and dance in favor of the best one, they th what, what they think is the best one. Mm. There's gradually consensus being built up. It's almost like a democracy. <laughs> and they finally decide, yes, this is the one to go. And they go. So uh, a lovely kind of decision-making process going on there. Could all be instinctive, we don't know. But what is <coughs> nice about this one I want to tell you is that James Near uh, found out uh, three or four years ago that let's say the bee is, the, a bee is dancing, right? And it's advertising some particular food source. Now if another bee watching this dance has been to that food source and has been wounded by, for example, a, a spider lurking there in ambush and has come back fairly damaged, you know, wounded, <coughs> it, will, it will headbutt this dancing bee and stop it from dancing to advertise that food source. And, and this stopping is very specific to the food source that's being signaled. If it's only the same position, it's only the food source that location where this bee has had a, had, a, had, a, had a problem, only then, then only then will this headbutting happen. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? And apparently, it also depends upon the degree of damage or the degree of wounding. So he's actually, uh, he's, he's selectively wounded these bees by small amounts and larger amounts by pinching them with forceps in the legs. Um, and uh, slight wounding that does not cause too much damage uh, does not cause head budding, but severe wounding causes head budding. So they've obviously got some way of assessing uh, the level of discomfort mm. uh, and signaling it on. Now, you could say all of this is instinctive, uh, pre-programmed, but I find it hard to accept.
Mm. Anyway, I, I laid this evidence before you. It's lovely work. Uh, uh, but uh, it, it, I'll give you the reference if you're interested. Yeah. So it seems then there, there's no you know uh, task uh, you directly test this, but uh, what what you described seems to suggest that the bees can actually have uh, confidence about their sensory decision or memory or something, right? Is there some direct evidence that they have a sort of a representation of their sensory or you know memory representation? I don't know if it's direct evidence. It certainly it certainly suggests that. Mm. I don't know. If it's, I don't know. I mean, the trouble, you know. I mean, the whole thing is very subjective, isn't it? I mean, we um, we tend to draw a hard line between vertebrates and invertebrates, mm. and we say anything that an invertebrate does, it has to be a, just just a, a reflex. Whereas the same thing is exhibited by a vertebrate, a higher vertebrate, we, 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 we tend to attribute more to it. Right. But some, <laughs> some rats and so uh, dolphin studies and things like that uh, use this uh, cancelling task where you have you, you can make a decision on to A or B, but if you are not you know confident, they can uh, you know skip the task, skip the trial, and then to go to the next one, and varying the difficulty of the task as the task becomes more and more difficult. They just you know cancel more and more often. Hmm. That sort of suggests uh, you know this representation of confidence, right? Yeah, this, it, 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 something it like could that. Be, it, could, it, could be, it could be that, but you know the hardliners will probably say, okay, it's it's just programmed to optimize the chances of getting getting things right, and so it, it's canceling the things when if something has a low probability of getting getting success, mm. finding success, you you if it has high entropy, then you basically discard that because you're wasting your time. Mm. I mean, if there's some, you know. Uh, Built yeah. in, but I'm with you. I would love to say that it is not conscious. <laughs> Certainly, from colony to colony, there could be differences. <laughs> don't know. Really, don't know. Really, don't know. It'd be a very interesting study. Yeah, no idea. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. speaking. Sorry. Another question. I wonder: Is there a hallmark or instinctive automatic behavior that is very sort of um, stereotyped? So it, it ignores all the kind of sensory inputs. For instance, sticklebacks say, "Oh, on this one, this red belly there." Could you, could, you, could you try to distract them with other kind of evidence sort of that, uh, that goes against the, the normal conclusion and see if they <coughs> I don't know. Maybe one can think of an experiment to do that. I don't know. Good point. 